Good morning. Once again, if you're a guest with us today, we, uh, we are really glad that you're here uh, in Fontenot family as well. I think somewhere over in here, we celebrate with you guys as well, and we welcome you to be a part of our church family today. Boys and girls, uh, today I want you to listen for a couple of things. The first thing is I want you to listen for a story about the great zucchini. And secondly, I want you to listen for a big word that the Bible uses. It's the word righteousness. And you're going to hear me say that word a lot this morning. And so by the end of the sermon, I want you to be able to say what that word actually means. Our passage today starts a new section in the Sermon on the Mount. And my goal this morning is I want to set us up for the next few weeks to help us keep all of it together. It's easy to glance through the Sermon on the Mount and just kind of read the section headings and to think that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is just covering a bunch of different random topics, like it's kind of open mic night where he's just talking about whatever things that he wants to talk about. So a little on anger, then a little on marriage, then a little on prayer, some on anxiety, and it can feel disconnected, but that's not, that's not the case. If you remember, Jesus said at the beginning, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, then you need a righteousness that far exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus has been teaching us what that deeper righteousness really is. What it truly means for us to live as God's people whose lives display the character and the nature of God in all sorts of different areas of our lives. And today we're starting a new section where Jesus will teach us on giving, prayer, and fasting over these next few weeks. But again, he's not changing the subject. He's continuing to teach us what this deeper righteousness looks like. And today, he's going to confront us with some hard questions. What is it that really motivates you? Whose approval are you really chasing? And are you even aware of it? Are you living as one who is self-deceived because you're living your life before the face of others instead of living before the face of God? So, should be pretty light today. We've come to chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Now, the careful reader of the Sermon on the Mount would read that and remember what Jesus said earlier in chapter 5 when he said, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. You're like, okay, so which is it? Do good works so that the world may see them, or don't do good works before others so that you're not seen. So does that mean that Mark and Lori Reisner need to come up to the church at 4 a.m. to prepare communion on Sunday so that no one sees them? Yes, it does. Mark, Lori, (laughs) I'm, I'm sorry. Or what about all the other people you see serving on a Sunday morning? What is Jesus saying? Well, notice that Jesus says, beware. He's giving us a caution, not a prohibition. Jesus is inviting you into a deeper examination of your own heart. To focus not so much on your actions, but to look at your motivations. What is it that really motivates you? What is it that really pulls your strings? Are you really aware of the desires within you? He's saying, be careful. Because you can do righteous things with an unrighteous heart. 
So beware of your desire for affirmation. Do you really know what your heart's looking for? Now here we are listening to Jesus continue to use this word righteousness. What does it really mean? Do you know what it means? It's a word that the Bible uses all the time. And if you've been raised in church, you've probably heard it more times than you could count. And maybe you kind of glaze over when you hear it because it feels like a word that doesn't really apply to the day in, day out reality of your life. But my contention is that you already have a pretty deep understanding of what righteousness really means. Because the dynamics of righteousness are constantly at work in your life. And you actually hear it and feel it and see it all the time, all around you. So we just need to connect the dots. Now, if I asked everyone here a question, what does it mean to be righteous? I bet the most common answer would be one that defined it just in terms of morality, right? So righteousness would be a statement of someone's moral purity and virtue. Now, it's not that morality isn't a part of it, but that doesn't really get to the heart of what righteousness really means. To see it, let's just start from scratch. Let's just pretend like you've never even heard the word until now. Righteousness in its most basic, simple definition isn't a moral term. It's actually a relational term. Righteousness is the quality of one standing in relation to another. And so relationally, if someone is righteous, then it means that they have a right standing in the eyes of another. They have a good standing with them. They're approved and accepted and affirmed by another because they've met the demands and the expectations of the relationship. But don't make the mistake of thinking those demands and expectations are always good and moral. Because who gets to determine what those standards really are? And who have you allowed to set the standards of righteousness in your own life? Because the dynamics of righteousness are constantly at work all around you. Why? Because this world makes all sorts of demands of you. Telling you what you have to do to be righteous in its eyes. And it preys on that part of you that wants to feel affirmed and accepted. You feel it in your job, your parenting, your family. You feel it when you scroll online. So let's take a deep dive for a second and look at me, or look at our world with me through the lens of righteousness. Because, friends, it's everywhere. My favorite way to illustrate this comes from an article about the most popular entertainer for children's birthday parties in the D.C. metro area that goes by the name The Great Zucchini. The Great Zucchini charges $600 an hour, (laughs) requires payment up front, He's booked six months in advance, and he's wildly popular. And the reporter who wrote the article had a friend who'd already hired the great Zucchini for three different birthday parties, and they'd hired them already for their fourth. So the reporter interviewed their friend for the story, and they just asked the most obvious question, why spend so much money on this guy? Why would you do it once? Sure, but four times? The friend said this. The whole thing is snowballed into levels of craziness. And it's just embarrassing to be a part of it. I know it's an insane, indulgent thing to do. You could just have a party where you played pin the tail on the donkey or musical chairs or something. But that's just not done in this part of D.C., If you did that, you would be talked about. 
But that's just not done in this part of D.C. If you did that, you'd be talked about. Did you hear it? Who's the party in the great zucchini really for? It's not for the child. It's for the parent. Why? What are they really after? They're after righteousness. Righteousness according to their peers. Righteousness according to their neighbors. They know they have to throw the right kind of party and meet those unspoken demands to be accepted and approved and have right standing in the eyes of their peers. Because if they don't do what's expected, then they face rejection. Because they didn't meet the standards. And just think, on the outside, somebody drives by and they just see a fun party. But on the, on the inside, her real motivation is right standing with her peers. She wants that fear and insecurity to be calmed by the approval of her peers that says, we affirm you. You have done well. And you are righteous in our eyes. You belong here. You are a part of us. This is why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus doesn't care about the outside. He only wants to look at the inside. Do you really know what motivates you? Do you really know what pulls your strings? Do you really know the desires of your own heart? Righteousness is everywhere. Let's just take a step back for a second and look at it at a much larger scale. Because, friends, this is all that cancel culture is. It's just a group of people that establish standards of righteousness, and if you don't conform, then you don't belong, and you are canceled. You are deemed unrighteous in their eyes. Righteousness is more than just actions. It speaks to that part of you that looks for approval and acceptance and wants to feel like you are okay in the eyes of another. It feeds on those insecurities, always wondering if you've done enough, if you've done the right thing, if you look good enough, if you are enough. And all throughout your life, you're asked to measure up and live according to the righteousness of the world around you in all sorts of ways that say to you this is how you will be accepted in our eyes. Now, it's easy to see when we look at that parent in D.C.'s life. But what do you see when you look at yours? What really motivates you? What's righteousness according to your job? What's expected of you in order to be accepted and to gain approval? And I'm not talking about the demands of being a good employee. No, I'm talking much deeper than that. Maybe it's meeting the unspoken expectation that everything else comes second to the company. It's company first, family second. So righteousness in the eyes of the company means that you're overworked with overtime. Or maybe it's the expectation to participate in the gossip of your colleagues, or in the crude jokes, or in the spouse bashing. And if you don't, then maybe you don't really fit in here. Maybe it's engaging in a level of excess on business trips, because that's just how business is done here, if you want the contract. And whatever it may be, however it comes and however it's presented to you, you know that if you don't do those things, then maybe Maybe you're not really part of the team. Maybe you don't really belong here. And you run the risk of being seen as unrighteous according to the values of the firm. What's righteousness according to your family? What's required in order to have right standing with them? Maybe it's the unspoken agreement that everyone has to walk on eggshells around a certain family member. 
Because everyone revolves around keeping them happy. Why? Because if they're unhappy, then everyone feels their wrath. So this is how we make sure everything goes okay. This is how we keep the peace. And so as long as you play by those rules, then you will have right standing with everyone. But if you don't keep that status quo and you disrupt the orbit, then everyone gets upset with you. And now you are viewed as the problem. So the motivation is not real relationship. It's avoiding conflict and upholding the peace treaty. Or maybe it's chasing the approval of a parent that you can never seem to satisfy. They've always been critical in your success and crushing in your mistakes. And you have chased that approval your entire life. Just wanting to hear them say, you are okay. Or maybe it's the unspoken rule that this family never talks about issues. You will have right standing with everyone as long as you sweep everything under the rug. Maybe you feel the weight of righteousness in your friendships. Always analyzing and second guessing if what you said in a conversation was taken the wrong way. Or if you unknowingly upset someone. Or always just feeling that gnaw in your gut that someone might be upset with you. And so it's just easier then to not be around people. It's just easier to make yourself scarce because it's just so exhausting to always be worried if you are unrighteous in the eyes of another. And parents, I know you feel it. I know you feel it when you scroll online. Don't you feel the unspoken expectations of what righteousness in the suburbs looks like? I was at Asher's soccer practice this past week, and I was talking with another parent about the pressure they feel when they scroll online and see people post about their kids. They've been in a hard place, a hard season, and they're just trying to survive, but <laughs> scrolling is like, oh, your first grader hasn't read War and Peace yet? <laughs> you know? Check out this Rembrandt that my four-year-old replicated on the way to soccer practice in the back of the Suburban. Why can't you do this? Why aren't your kids like this? What are you doing wrong? They feel this constant pressure like they're failing as a parent. And they're doing the best they can. And they feel that motivation to measure up. And yet they know that that motivation has nothing to do with their kid. It's about the approval of the surrounding community and a way so heavily upon them. Redeemer Youth, how about you? I know you feel the demands and the expectations of righteousness according to your peers. You feel it in ways I never did. And my heart goes out to you. You feel the weight of what you have to do for your peers to say that you're accepted and affirmed and to have right standing with them. You have to figure out your sexuality. You have to say how you identify. But maybe you don't even really understand what that even means. You just want to get some Chick-fil-A with your friends. Boys, you have to be more experienced than you really are. Girls, you have to dress to get more attention than you really want. Let your pastor just tell you, you are okay. 60 plus, what about you? What does the world say is righteousness on the other side of retirement? Those subtle expectations and questions about whether or not you've really lived a life worth living. So how padded is your retirement account? How much did you really accomplish in your career? Oh, you didn't have a career. You just stayed home with your kids. Oh, not all of your kids are professing believers. I'm so sorry. What kind of parent were you? It's everywhere. The standards of righteousness. 
Its dynamics are at work all around us all the time. You are surrounded by expectations and requirements and do's and don'ts for how you can gain approval, be accepted, fit in, and have right standing with the world around you. Because there's all sorts of voices that say, if you want to feel okay and at peace, then this is what's required of you in order for us to declare you righteous in our eyes. And we feel the weight of it. We feel the weight of all of that. And here's the thing. That's okay. That's okay. Why? Because that's how you were made. That is how you were made. You were made to be at peace with your environment. You were made to live in harmony with the world around you that received you. But most importantly, you were made with an infinite capacity for affirmation. The self-deception would be to think that you weren't. It's what we're told from the very beginning, because notice that nowhere will Jesus say, anywhere in the Sermon on the Mount, to not want to be affirmed and approved. He asks, do you really know where to find it? When God came face to face with a lifeless Adam and breathed into his nostrils... He awakened to a world that received him and accepted him in all of his created glory. But best of all, he awakened to the shining face of God looking right back at him. He woke into the face of God that looked back at him and said, This is good. And Adam lived in the full presence of God's affirmation and delight. But in the fall, we lost it. We lost his face. And we've been looking for it ever since. We look for it in the face of every lover, every boss, every friend, every project, every car, every pair of clothes, something to tell me, I'm okay. This is why Jesus says, beware. Because he's speaking to that part of us that looks for that affirmation and acceptance, that wants to feel some significance, like we matter, like we're seen, like we have value, the way we were created. He speaks to that part of us that just wants to hear someone say, you're okay. Why? So that we'd actually be honest and awaken to those desires Within us. And Jesus applies this caution to three different areas of life to the giving of alms, to prayer, and to fasting. He just uses three examples to illustrate his point three basic spiritual practices that can be so twisted by our own desires and our need to be seen and affirmed. And when he does, he uses a specific word in his warning. He uses the word hypocrite. He says, so when you give to the needy, don't march into the temple blowing a trumpet like the hypocrites so that they'll be praised by everybody. He says, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites on the street corners wanting praise for their eloquence and their many words. And when you fast, don't fast like the hypocrites who go around looking miserable to receive praise and honor for how much they're suffering. Don't be a hypocrite. So why is Jesus using this word? Maybe part of it is that, or, or maybe part of you have heard, or some of you have heard that hypocrite comes from the Greek word for actor. Someone who wears a mask and acts like someone they're not to deceive others. But there's actually another meaning of hypocrite that Jesus is using here. Hypocrite can certainly mean deceiving others. But it can also mean that you have deceived yourself. So he's saying, don't be a hypocrite who is self-deceived about the desires within them and the motivations of their own heart. But self-deceived about what? Jesus is pointing out something about sin that so often goes unnoticed. We know that sin is when we replace God with ourselves 
But Jesus is reminding us that it's also when we, re we replace God with others. We're self-deceived about how we put others in the place of God in our lives. We look to them for approval and affirmation and acceptance to secure just our sense of identity and worth, to give us that sense of value. And so we can come to church, we can do good things and look like great people, look like we're put together on the outside, but on the inside, our lives and our hearts are wrapped up in living before the face of others instead of living before the face of God. And Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites. Why? Because you will receive your reward just like them. Sure, you'll get a moment of attention and applause, but just know that that's as good as it's going to get because you're self-deceived, because you'll be pursuing something that will never satisfy that insecurity within you, and yet you will still chase it like it can. So just think about your own life for a second. And the standards of righteousness you try to meet that you feel the weight of in your life. Think of how exhausting it is. And how much of your time and your life it can consume. Has chasing it actually made your life any better? Has trying to jump through those hoops taken away any of that insecurity within you? Do you really feel free? That's why Jesus also says to you in this passage, there is another way. In fact, there's a way back to that affirmation and approval that was lost so long ago. Jesus says something for the first time in the Gospel of Matthew here in the Sermon on the Mount that we haven't even talked about yet. Despite the ways that he's already flipped everything upside down, he's been saying something that would have been so incredibly new for his audience to hear. And it is so easily lost on us. He calls God Father. He calls God Father. But not only that, he says, Your Father. Your Father. Heavenly Father, your Father in heaven. That was a completely new thought. Because that kind of intimate relationship was not how a Jew would have described their relationship with God. It also might not be how you would describe yours either. Because maybe for you, the idea of a father is a source of deep hurt and pain. Maybe you never really had a good relationship with your father. He was present, but absent. Disconnected and unavailable. Always concerned with other things. Maybe his words left you with deep scars. Or maybe he was never even there. And you've never even met your father. And so when Jesus starts talking about God as father, it's not the warmest feeling in the world for you. And he might as well be talking about a unicorn. Perhaps if you were honest with yourself, maybe a big part of your life has been trying to figure out who you are. Looking for others to offer some sense of affirmation and approval that you were never really given the chance to experience or even offered in the first place. And that's exactly what lies at the heart of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount and why, moving forward, he will continue to mention the Father over and over at every single topic, every single point along the way. He wants you to see the Father in how you give and how you live and how you pray and how you fast and how you think about your problems and your anxieties and your fears so that your whole life, your entire existence would be reoriented and seen through a whole new lens that you have a heavenly father 
in heaven who sees you, who loves you, who delights in you, who wants to give good things to you, and who will reward you. Because when that sinks into your heart, that changes everything. The idea of a good heavenly father allows us to see everything in a whole new light and it gives us a whole different motivation. So Jesus applies this to giving of alms. Alms weren't the same as the tithe. They were gifts that were given above and beyond tithes to care for the poor and the needy. And so Jesus says, why don't you rethink giving in terms of the Father? You don't have to blow the trumpet to seek praise from others when you give because your Father in heaven sees you in secret and he will be your praise. He will reward you. Why? Because you're doing exactly what your heavenly Father does. You're joining him in what brings him joy. You're caring for those in need, for the poor and for the destitute. You can give generously and care for the needs of others because you have a heavenly father who cares for you and yours. Are you willing to be motivated by your father's generosity towards you? Jesus will apply this to prayer and he will say, rethink prayer in terms of your father in heaven. So he will say, when you pray, start with this, our Father. You don't have to go pray in public squares like the hypocrites. Because why do you need their attention when you have the attention of your heavenly Father? You can always pull on his pant leg. And I know you're thinking prayer is hard. I pray and I feel like I get radio silence. But of course you do. It's because he's a good father. And every good father knows when to be silent. And just listen. And talk when he's ready. Are you willing to be motivated by his desire to hear you? Jesus will say when you fast, you don't have to contort your face so everybody knows you're suffering. Their attention is not going to satisfy that hunger within you, but your heavenly Father's will. He'll apply this to our worries and how we fear tomorrow with all of its troubles and anxieties. And he says, you can let all of that go. Your Father feeds the birds of the air. So how much more is he going to take care of you? Are you willing to be motivated by how precious you are to him? This is why we need Jesus. Because it's through him that he leads us back to the Father. That through him, the way back to his face is now open. And do you hear what Jesus has done? He sets you free. He sets you free from the standards of righteousness this world demands of you. He sets you free from all the ways this world tells you how to feel accepted, and to feel okay. He sets you free and he says you don't have to live before the face of others. You can live before the face of your heavenly Father who sees you and loves you and delights in you. And he's also the heavenly Father that says to you, Christian, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. For the glory of Christ and the life of the world, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would fill us up with a new sense of your love, your kindness, and your mercy towards us. We ask that we would know the freedom of those who have found their life and their identity and their righteousness in you. We ask that you would meet us here at this table, that you would feed us and nourish us with the life that you so freely offer to us. 
the life you offered on the cross and the resurrection life that you invite us into. Meet each of us just where we are, for you know just what we need. We ask all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen.